Hey, let's get this show on the road. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me again for another day text. As you know, if you've joined us before, we work our way progressively through the various biblical books and letters. At times, we'll also consider other information specific to the God Jaw, references to Jesus, how we should treat others, and anything having to do with our history that we can relate to the biblical events or that will help us appreciate our origins and the people who came before us and what they taught, what they believed, what is the evidence that we have to show one way or the other that what they experienced was correct. So we discuss these ancient writings and texts. We talk about their practical application in during the time they were written and also today. And then we look into the issues that relate to the events themselves and the credibility behind them, the historicity of these uh, biblical letters and documents. So we're working our way through the letter, the letter, I would say the letter of Revelation, probably because it's right after the letters of John and Jude. Anyway, we're in the Revelation and I have not translated all of it. We go, we do these day texts based on the material I've translated so that I can properly discuss the material and not bring in too many different translations and get off on the um, variant reading issues or alternate translation issues. We try to focus on the text and what it teaches unless there's a serious translation issue or variant reading that we need to consider. So we're in the second chapter of Revelation. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 6. Yes, I just noticed the kind of a... So, uh, welcome to all of you who are um, either in the, on the chat or watching otherwise. I do my best to try to mention that. And I, I, I try to wait a little bit because people show up or come and go and then some you know and some you don't know. But um, I always mean to start out with a general welcome. So, if I didn't do that, I think I did. But if I didn't, I'll say it again. So, we're getting into Revelation chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Let's take a look here. Because we started out with Revelation chapter 1, reading a portion of it, where we talked about how the revelation is something given by God to Jesus, who in turn sent his angels to deliver it to John. And so John is communicating all these different things that he's receiving from the angels, from Jesus, and ultimately from God. And he's right at, in our view, the end of the first century, so we've had a good 50 plus years of solid Christianity. People teaching the things about Jesus after he's died, pointing to the texts that show his fulfillment, engaging Jews, Gentiles over these different issues. And they've gone through various persecutions, such as with Nero. And now we're at the point where John is receiving information regarding these different Christian groups that they've helped uh, develop with um, the Holy Spirit. So, now we have a more organized group of Christians versus, you know, like in the book of Acts, even though they were to some extent organized and becoming more organized, they were still involved in a variety of different missionary tours and ways that were designed to help build up the congregations in all these different places. So here we are, John is receiving this revelation, a series of visions that are going to be significant, obviously, for the Christians and for the whole world. So let's take a look. He's first addressing the Christians, and he's addressing specific Christians who live in Ephesus. And so you, you might um, recall Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So it was a congregation of Christians in Ephesus. And here's what it says in verse 1. We're going to read 1 through 6 of chapter 2, and then we'll talk about it. To the messenger of the Christians gathered in Ephesus, you must write, the one who controls the seven bright lights or stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, speaks these things. This is Jesus. This is the first one and the last one the one who became dead and who is now living forever and ever, with the keys of death and Hades, whose appearance in its overall 
in his overall appearance is as the brightness of its sun, of the sun in its full glory, according to chapter one. Okay, this is who is now about to speak. That that one, the Son of God. Verse two. I have become familiar with your works and hard labor. In other words, he's checked them out. He has been evaluating them for a period of time, likely decades, obviously, since his resurrection. I have become familiar with your works and hard labor and your endurance. Namely, you cannot stand evil people. You even investigated those who talk about themselves as if they are official representatives or apostles, but they're not. You even came to the conclusion they are liars. Verse 3, you do not give up. You carried a great burden because of my name, and you have not quit. Verse 4, on the other hand, I'm holding this against you. You let go of the love you had at first, or your first love. Verse 5, so you must think about why you've fallen and start believing differently or express regret. Alternate reading, you must complete the first works. Verse 6, however, you do have this. You detest the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also detest. Let's just start right there real briefly. So he obviously dislikes the Nicolaitans. And he also refers to them again in verse uh, 15 or 16 of the same chapter. Right after he references the teaching of Balak and Balaam that um, caused the Israelites to stumble and eat food sacrificed to idols. So there's an association often made between the teaching of Balaam and Balak in, in several verses later, verses 14 and 15, and the, the, the subsequent message uh, reference to the Nicolaitans. But, and then the early church references we have similarly involves the Nicolaitans with different types of uh, excessive eating beyond the apostolic decree, that is foods offered to idols or blood, and also pornography or what we it's often translated as fornication but it's really pornea and so they were involved in excessive sexual misconduct and they were doing things in direct violation of the apostolic decree in ways that at this time were necessary so that the christians could develop and grow together with jews and gentiles even though jesus had declared all foods clean right the apostles came together and realized they were having a problem because the Gentiles and, and others who are freed by Jesus in terms of what they could eat were potentially and likely eating things that were sacrificed to idols and with blood in ways more openly that were causing the Jews to stumble and even offending probably some of the Christians because of their, their sensitivities toward the Mosaic law in spite of what Jesus came and freed them from. So then they developed those apostolic standards that would, be, would allow them now to continue to develop the Christian congregation among so many different people without offending them in ways that would be just too difficult to explain, right? Why are we eating blood and food sacrificed to idols? And the Jews are saying, what are you doing? You're supposed to be worshiping the God that we claim, although you believe in the Messiah. Well, that makes it very difficult, right? What are we going to say? Well, Jesus freed us from all food, so we <laughs> they're not going to recognize that. And that's why Paul in 1 Corinthians, he writes the way he does, and he says, look, if something's going to make your brother stumble... Don't eat it, right? He basically says, <laughs> that's the weaker person. You're stronger, so you can your conscience allows you to, to eat or not eat in ways that don't burden you. But some of these other people, weaker Christians, Jews who have not yet converted but who are following the Mosaic Law, they can't handle you know, things like that, eating uh, pretty much everything. So that's why they had to bring it in in order to create a... a uh, a way to deal with these different people. And when you think of sacrifices to idols or blood, are those really necessary, right? I mean, they're, they're directly spoken of against the scriptures. And even though Jesus freed us from all things, the fact is that Paul makes it very reasonable, right? If we know it's been sacrificed to an idol, if we know it's been dedicated to another God, well, why would we eat it? We can, as long as our conscience is clear and we recognize that we're not eating it to that idol, but to Jah, so we can still do it. But if our brother or, or a non-believing Jew is right there, or somebody else who would be stumbled, well, 
how badly do we have to eat <laughs> that type of food? So we need to be reasonable and show love to other people and not insist on getting every single thing we want just because we can. Now, these are some of the more minor things when it comes to the issues involved here because <laughs> even though that's important, right? I mean, obviously what we eat and whether or not it offends other people or jaw and of course excessive sexual immorality, pornography, those are concerns. That's why Jesus doesn't like the Nicolaitans. But notice here, okay, so that's at the end of the reading. And then he talks about it more, as I mentioned, in, in later on in chapter 2. But look at the first part here. He, he, let's jump, look at verse 2. I have become familiar with your works and your hard labor and your endurance. Namely, okay, this is what he has become familiar with. This is what he checked them out and found. You can't stand evil people. You can't stand them. And so you investigated them or the ones that talk about themselves as if they're official representatives, my apostles. They, these people are claiming to have been sent directly by Jesus. Let me read his words one more time. You even investigated those who talk about themselves as if they are official representatives, but they are not. Who talks about themselves today as official representatives of God? I don't even think I need to mention the, the groups that do, right? I mean, we pretty much know the ones who claim to have governing bodies, prophets, popes, all the stuff. And they're not. They're not. They talk about themselves as if they are official representatives. How often, have, if you were ever a member of the Watchtower, I mean, it's like nonstop, right? Constantly referring to themselves as God's agent, God's people, God's organization, the truth. They call themselves the truth when they know very well that Jesus is the truth. They say they're the place to go because there's nowhere else to go. When Jesus says he's the one you go to because there's no one else to whom to go. They change both of those. You think that's an accident? You think they just accidentally started calling themselves the truth and not Jesus? You think they just accidentally started saying we're the only place you can go to? Versus saying Jesus is the only one you can go to, like he actually said. You think those are accidents? I don't think so. I don't think they're that stupid. You understand? It's like the retards that we deal with on the channel sometimes. I don't think they're that dumb. Nope. That's why it says at the end of verse 2, you even came to the conclusion they are liars. These people are lying to us. These people who are acting like they're following the Christ are wolves dressed as sheep. Remember what Jesus said that the false Christ would do, that they would proclaim the kingdom of God is here? You think that's an accident? That the Watchtower organization has constantly proclaimed that and failed? No. I don't think that's an accident at all. That requires a lot of intention and forethought, actually. And they've done it multiple times. Let me just read that again. You investigated those who talk about themselves as if they are official representatives. He's approving these people. Now, I wrote an article specific to this verse. Verse 2, Revelation 2, 2, 2. I'm going to show it here. It's called, Put Them to the Test. I wrote it back in 2011. You can see it on my blog here, watching the ministry. I highly recommend you read this article if you're in any way confused about what the Watchtower has done to people. And remember, it's not like the Watchtower has never done good or that groups like Mormons or Catholics or others who may have certain special agents that they work through haven't done good. That's not the point. The point is, are they lying to us about these official representations? And are we supposed to be following them to the extent that they claim we are? Or we're, we're like unapproved? Well, this article will go through the use of this text, Revelation 2.2, at least for the uh, Watchtower Society, 
I think you'll be astounded at some of the things that I found here. They never apply this text to themselves. Never. They never apply Revelation 2.2 to themselves and say, are you following this counsel and investigating us? Because we're making special claims to be God's appointed representatives. Are you doing what Jesus said and checking us out? Never. In fact, they always apply it to others, that, that other people are afraid to, to be checked out. Never them. And yet they're one of the most feared, fearful. They are the, one of the most afraid groups <laughs> of checking them out because of what you'll find, right? They're not interested in just promoting God, Jesus, and how you treat others uh, because they say that themselves. Let's take a look right here. I'll just read one text. It's, it's an extensive article because I go through, I did a search through their CD and found a number of different references. Um, but let me share with you just a couple of things. So here, here's one text from an article in 1964, Faithful Endurance in the Time of the End. I put the reference right here. But notice what they say. Where else can a Christian go? Peter stated there was no other place is that what Peter stated? No. He said, Lord, to whom? Peter said there was no other person. They ripped the word from the text and put place. Instead of whom, they put what or place. Do you think they're that stupid? Do you, do you think this was an accident? That they just didn't know what Peter said, even though they referenced the text? And the New World Translation had been out by now. They'd actually translated the text. So then they, they tell you right away what they're talking about. And thus, the wisdom of faithfully sticking to Jehovah's organization today. Your very life depends on it. Yet that's not what Jesus said or what Peter said. How many times do we need to see this before we realize it's not an accident? I know it takes time. It took me a little time. But I realized it wasn't an accident. Now notice here Jesus' words in Matthew 24, 5. Look out that you are not misled. Many will come on the basis of my name, saying, I am the Christ. And the due time is approached. What does Jesus say? Do not go after them. That's all the Watchtower says. The due time is approached. It's here. I've said that for over 100 years. Do not go after them. It couldn't be any clearer, could it? Put them to the test. Investigate them. You're going to find out they're liars. Why? I did not send them. They're talking about themselves. And in the Greek text, it uses the reflexive pronoun there in Revelation 2.2, 2, where it says they call themselves. Whereas the NWT just says, and I talk about that in this article, it just says they say they are apostles. No, just, they just say it. But the text actually makes it specific that they're calling themselves something. And that's exactly what the Watchtower does all the time. I, it may, may be in every single publication. They call themselves God's representatives or appointed agent. They're the Watchtower. Right? They're the ones watching over everyone appointed to do so by God. This is not an un unclear teaching in their writings. And so here at the end, I just dis discussed the uh, reflexive pronoun issue. But I wanted to share just a couple quotes from you here from this article. So you not only recognize the material that it contains, but you can also see some of the quotes from the society's literature over time that really uh, <laughs> just do not line up with what we're told here. And in fact, I want to share one more quote with you so you can see how serious this is. Uh, now, so you, you notice here, remember, our view is that we promote Jah, Jesus, and how to treat others, right? That's it. We leave everything else to everyone else because we don't get involved in your life. We're not going to answer for you. You are. We help when you need it. That's it. Here in the 1986 issue of The Watchtower, page 31, April 1st edition, Look at what it says. Obviously, obviously, 
a basis for approved fellowship with Jehovah's Witnesses cannot rest merely on a belief in God, the Bible, in Jesus Christ, and so forth. Obviously, right? Well, obviously, that's all you need with us. Okay? That's all the Bible requires of you. I had some of these things, when I read them now, they just, I mean, this is what it says. why he says you can't stand evil people. And we know these people come to us in the sheep's clothing. But look at what they do. They violate every single thing he says not to do. They proclaim that the, that the appointed time is near. They call themselves the truth. He's the truth. They say there's no other place to go but them. The text says there's no other person to go to but him. Jesus says to investigate those who call themselves official representatives. They say to investigate everyone else who calls them that, not them. They say approved fellowship with Jaws people obviously can't just be based on those three things. God, the Bible, and Jesus Christ. Obviously, right? <laughs> so, they're so far gone from what it's going to require, which is so simple, so light, yet they burden people with all this stuff. They're not even supposed to be writing about end times, right? Paul said so. You don't need anything to be written to us about times and seasons, yet that's pretty much all they write about. I mean, it's over and over again they're violating the scriptural texts. It's not just one. It's ongoing violation of the biblical texts. This is what they're doing. Now, some of you may be familiar with the Watchtower and Ages Pastor at times when they did good things. And again, I'm not saying they don't do good things. Almost every group does some good things. But not every, the groups are not the same. Remember, I've used the illustration of Japan, right? Is Japan the same today as it was during World War II? They're totally different. Is Germany the same today? as it was during World War II? Is America today the same as it was during the Civil War? People and nations and groups change. They don't just remain the same forever. That's the whole point of all these warnings. So we're not fooled by people who claim to be something they're not. That's exactly what we're told to do in today's text. You investigated those who claim to be something they're not. And you found out they were lying to you. The Watchtower does not help you come to those conclusions. I don't even think the Mormons help you come to those conclusions or the Catholics. They don't want you investigating all of the things they teach. They just want you accepting them. And while we accept some as Christians and those among those groups will work with us on the three things, no problem. All this other stuff is not required by the biblical text. And we are required to put you to the test to find out if you've actually been officially appointed by God or not. We can't just accept that because you tell us you are. That's exactly what the text tells us to watch out for. People who call themselves God's official representatives or ones that he has sent. We are. He approves of you if you do that. Not just to do it to cause trouble or to get out of doing what you're responsible to doing for him. You're supposed to be investigating people for the purpose of realizing whether they're right or wrong and then doing something about it for yourself and for anyone who might be affected. All right, well, we cannot shut down every group that's misleading people. We teach the truth and the ones who are ready to listen and that the Father calls will respond to us. But these people are making it more difficult. They're putting themselves in the way they're the truth. They're the place to go to. They're God's official representatives that you can't investigate. All the things that are directly against what we read in the scriptures. So, I hope that was helpful. <laughs> and if you need more information, take a look at my article there um, that I, I put in the description below. Very good article to share with others because it's very lengthy in the sense that it contains a lot of citations and information that will help you understand how the Watchtower Society and others are really avoiding this text. Revelation 2.2 is like, like 
a text they, they really don't, I don't think, like at all because it empowers us to do the very thing they don't want us to do, and that is check them out. So we have a comment here, and, and this is, I think, something we've all experienced at times. Sweeney Rod saying, I attend the Kingdom Hall still on occasion, but it's hard to not point out the faults. You just have to be prepared to be shunned on a certain level if you do. Exactly. <laughs> you start saying anything against what they're teaching, they're, they're not going to have it. And the same is true for a Trinitarian group. That's why I did that video on the things, watch, the one thing, watch how our people and Trinitarians have in common. So if you start teaching, you know, heck, if you even just read Revelation 2.2 2 and said, brothers, we need to start investigating everyone who's making these claims to fulfill this text. I mean, they would shut you down right there, right? <laughs> if you included them in it, everyone else, okay, but not them. But if you start contradicting anything at a kingdom hall, they're not going to have it. They will immediately contradict you back and eventually just suppress you, right? They won't call on you. And at a Trinitarian group, I, I've been to Trinitarian evangelical churches and I, and I just sat and listened. But if I were to start talking, right? If I were to start telling them my view of John 1, 1 or John 10, I mean, they, they'd freak out, right? They wouldn't let that happen. They would immediately contradict me and silence me. And that's why I don't do it. I'm not there to create disruption. So my point is, They'll shun you when it comes to ministerial activities or working together to promote the Christ. Maybe not in everyday life, and of course there's differences, but uh, they shun us. They, they don't, if we don't present their message, they won't work with us as Christians. It's that simple, okay? And we're similar. If they won't, if they'll contradict, right, the belief that the Father's the one God, Jesus is the sent forth Messiah, and treating others the way we want to be treated, we won't work with them in a ministry either. But, but we have a lot fewer requirements that are entirely based on the text. You understand? So our requirements are just one God the Father, Jesus is the sent forth Savior of the world, the Son of God, and the golden rule. Right Now, you, you may have a couple things within those three that you could take issue with if you really had to, but it's not like we don't have explicit texts that teach those three things. We do. We have a text, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, one God the Father. We have a text called Jesus, the Son of God, sent for Savior of the Father, 1 John 4. 1 John, the entire letter pretty much, and other texts, but that letter talks about him as the Son of God and the sent for Savior of the world and being from the beginning, just like John 1. No one disputes the golden rule, really, so I'm not going to get into that. My point is that we're not using a basis for not working with Christians that isn't reasonable. <laughs> I mean, it's a... It's about as reasonable. It's as reasonable as I could come up with. That's why I did. I thought, okay, this is this is the minimum that I would be able to reasonably require from someone and say, okay, if you accept these things and we're going to move past all this other stuff, let's go. Let's praise Jah, promote Jesus, treat us the way we want to be treated. But it just it always comes back to some other little some other issue, and so. You know, you, it, it's not the case that they, they will accept you as a Christian. They, they shun you in ministerial, like when it comes to minister activities or teaching in the congregations because they want to teach the Trinity, right? That's their, 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 their red line. Not one God the Father or Jesus is the Son of God sent for a Savior. The Trinity and other things too, but I'm just, let's keep it simple for now. The Watchtower. Well, you have to accept them as the appointed representatives of Jah. <laughs> the very thing you're not, that you're supposed to investigate, you have to accept unconditionally for them. So there's no way you could fulfill Revelation 2.2 among the Watchtower group because the second you start doing that, you're out of there. They would Once they identify you as someone investigating them to see if they're lying or not, and, and it's not just like a basic, oh, let me see if that quote's in the text, you're actually going to check them out. Right? This is a serious inquiry. They are claiming to represent God and Christ. You start doing that and, and investigating them, they're not going to have it. Or they're going to mark you and they're going to marginalize you. So they're using things that have nothing to do with the text. Right? Where does the text say you're supposed to shun people when it comes to Christian ministry? Because they don't believe you've been officially appointed by Jah. And all the evidence shows you've made so many mistakes it's a wonder why you even claim it anymore. The Trinitarians are doing the same thing. You know, they're using these later doctrines or the exposition of these doctrines as their 
um, put forth in later creeds as a basis for whether or not we accept we're accepted to, acceptable to them. So I try to keep it simple, right? If you believe in one God the Father and the Son sent forth the Son of God from heaven, gave His life for us so that we might live, and we treat others the way we want to be treated. When we make mistakes, we ask for forgiveness and we give it. That's it. See, if we do that, now we can focus. Now we can work together. Why? Because we're not worried about whether there are liars among us <laughs> claiming to be official representatives when, when what they're teaching and doing uh, shows that that's not likely the case. And we don't have people who are going to contradict what we're saying about God or Jesus among us. See, we can be effective with those three things. Not seeking out people who already claim to believe just so we can argue with them. What's the point of that? not going to get anywhere. They already know what you know, or they can find it out because they can read and they have the text too. It's very rarely the case. People with the Bible and who can read it are just totally unaware of some special text that if you just show it to them, they'll, it's like a light bulb will go off, right? It's, it's not about that. They just don't believe it. It's not a question of whether you have a good text to show them or the text is clear. What does Revelation 2.2 say? Does that, could that be any clearer? I mean, is that hard to figure out in terms of what he's saying there? You put, you investigated those who claim to be official representatives, apostles, and you found out they weren't. You found out they were liars and he approved them for it. Is that hard to see in that account? Okay, so then why isn't that encouraged? <laughs> why isn't that promoted in all these watchtower meetings and discussions that we should be investigating them, particularly them in light of all their special claims? Because they don't want to promote the belief of this text. It has nothing to do with lack of clarity or difficulty in translation. They just don't believe the text. So you can drive yourself crazy, you know, thinking, okay, this text will do it. This text, I'm going to show it. No, no, it's not that. They don't believe it. See, it's, you could show them a text like John 10 where Jesus himself refers to others as gods. They'll still call you a polytheist <laughs> because they don't believe that text Jesus is quoting. They don't believe that God called others gods in a way that's approved because they're actually his sons even though they're doing what's wrong. But that shows why it's right to call Jesus uh, God as the son of God who does what's right. So he sets up that contrast there perfectly. And, you know, you could read it to them and, Explain it, and it's not going to make any difference because they don't believe. And it's not like you have to believe before you have something or reason to believe. My point is, they're not in a condition open to believe. You see, they're not like searching or wondering or like questioning. They don't believe. I mean, they're like hardened against the idea, if you're the watchtower, of investigating them. Or if you're a Trinitarian, of, of rejecting the Trinity. See, so until you get those problems out of the way or you resolve the issues that are preventing them from accepting the texts you think are so convincing, it's not going to matter. It won't make any difference. It's like with the divine name. Me and Jack have been kind of talking about some issues there and he's talking to people who are, you know, obsessed or at least involved heavily with the Masoretic vow pointing of the divine name. <laughs> That's like the least credible material to be using for determining the pronunciation of the divine name. <laughs> and they were the very ones trying to hide it with vowel, pointing, vowel points from other terms. And they're not at all, they're often not consistent with earlier practices involving consonants and vowels, um, and consonant letters used as vowels. And so it just becomes this, this <laughs> big mush pot of vowel points and and borrowing vowels from other letter other words in order to prevent the pronunciation of the divine name and then you get into all these different um, pointing methods that have nothing to do with the ancient practice that practice developed much later by people who were so far removed from the use of the divine name in the biblical text that they just didn't want to use it anymore apparently or for whatever reason they continued the tradition of wrongly hiding the pronunciation when nothing in the bible teaches that later rabbinic commentaries on various biblical texts and or uh, oral traditions are what ultimately led them to um, cease pronouncing the divine name. But 
Even in texts like the Mishnah or in the writings of Josephus, you can see that they were pronouncing a divine name in the first century. We have evidence of that as well in the Greek phonetic forms. But my point is, in bringing that up, that, that Jack will, in regard with what I'm talking about, it could be Revelation 2 applied to the governing body. It could be John 10 applied against the Trinity. Or it could be the Greek phonetic evidence or the theophoric evidence, theophoric element evidence in other names that clearly show what's going on or what they were doing or what they did or what they taught. And you're always going to have someone because, see, they don't believe it, right? So they're, until they're ready to believe or want to believe, they're just going to come back at you with their tradition for non-belief, which is going to be based on things that have to do with or that have nothing to do with the evidence that involves your belief, right? What information does the Watchtower Society provide to you to contradict your application of Revelation 2.2? Nothing. Just the fact that they're the ones appointed, so you shouldn't investigate them. Even though that's the very thing you're supposed to investigate. What information do Trinitarians give us that contradicts Jesus' use of God's in John 10? Nothing. Except statements that just call God one, which is what we believe, and consistent with Jesus' own use of God's, because he understands those as sons of God. <laughs> Was Jesus a polytheist? No. And so in the same way, when it comes to the divine name, what evidence do people who reject the Greek phonetic forms that we have and uh, the other evidence which shows that the divine name was not pronounced, for example, Yahweh, because there's no evidence supporting the um, ending or the suffix as eh in any theophoric name. So, I mean, it's not like it's a questionable thing. It's 100%. Yet, they'll still go a thousand years into the future from the time of the first century when all the texts were uh, finally uh, written or had been written. And look to a vowel pointing system that didn't even exist that uses points from several different words to cloak the divine name from what it was supposed to be originally uh, pronounced as. And so using them would be like the worst possible source. The Masoretes. Just like using the Watchtower to interpret Revelation 2.2, worst possible source. Or going to the Trinity as a basis for understanding John 10. Totally, like the worst thing you could do, right? So the Masoretes, the, the Jews today who reject pronunciation of the divine name or some of them, they'll go a thousand years or more from the biblical period in the future to the Masoretes. You've got the Watchtower who will go 2,000 years ahead from Revelation 2.2 so that you look to them and don't investigate them. And you have the Trinitarians that will go several hundred years forward so that they can reinterpret the texts involving God and gods. <laughs> we just go to the text, okay? Stay in the first century or before. You'll be a lot happier, whether it's Revelation 2.2, 2, well, about right around that time, maybe 120 or earlier. My point is that in the context of thought, right, what they were doing, putting people to the test, right? You had Paul confronting Peter, exposing him in front of others. They didn't mess around. You were teaching something wrong. They confronted you. They didn't hide or you didn't cower before them because they were an apostle. It's just the opposite. Yet today, you question a governing body member. I mean, it's like, what are you doing, right? You wouldn't even be allowed to. So they put, they've elevated themselves above the congregation just like all false teachers do. That's the whole purpose is to put themselves above other people. So try to use the best information. It will save you. And while it's so tempting, I know, to want to keep talking to people who want to argue with you, you know, whether it's Watchtower people want to tell you about all the great things they're doing and how they're God's people, or the Trinitarians about how they've been teaching the Trinity for, you know, almost 2,000 years, or the Jews who tell us how the Masorites were so smart and gave us all these clues and they really didn't, or messed it up so badly that <laughs> we really can't use them effectively. My point is that we got to pick the right source. And not everyone is doing that. And we're not going to be able to change them. You think you're going to be able to change most Watchtower witnesses you meet from listening to the governing body as the official representative of God? Probably not. You think you're going to change most Trinitarians from accepting Jesus as the second person of the Trinity? Probably not. You think you're going to convince most Jews who don't believe you should be pronouncing the divine name or that it was pronounced Yahweh? in the face of all the Greek phonetic evidence and theophoric evidence? Probably not. <laughs> right? I mean, they have chosen their source. The Watchtower chooses itself. They, call, they, are, they are calling themselves 
representatives. The Trinitarians have chosen their councils and creeds and their scholars. The Jews have chosen the Masoretes, the rabbis, and non-Christian uh, beliefs and ideas. It's very rare you're going to penetrate either any of those three and <laughs> rescue like a large number of people. And now, of course, we do want to speak the truth and teach help correct things that are not right when we have the opportunity, even if we won't reach someone, right? If we, have, we see someone clearly teaching error, we should try to correct it so people aren't misled. But that's not the, like something we get caught up in all the time or for the majority of our time. Or if there's not someone who's maybe naive in, in the balance, if we're just arguing with someone who already knows what they're doing, and you can clearly see that their authority is either the watchtower, the creeds, or the rabbis, well, they're not going to really see what you're seeing. And so it can be frustrating for you. Don't expect that you're going to be able to convince everybody, even though you have such great arguments, right? Look at Revelation 2.2. 2. Is that not clear? Let's set aside the Trinity and the divine name and just look, let's just take this issue. Is it not clear that Jesus teaches that those who claim or talk about themselves as official representatives, that investigating those people is a good thing. Is that not clear? I mean, he is approving them. He's saying they investigated them to the point where you found they were wrong, even liars. So that's clear, right? How many Watchtower witnesses do you think you're going to convince to do that? So see, it doesn't always matter how clear the evidence is. You could show someone who believes that the divine name was pronounced Yahweh that there isn't one single name in the Bible with a theophoric suffix ending in A. It doesn't matter because they're not using the best available evidence. That's what we use. I encourage you to continue using it. I hope today's day text reading was helpful to you. We have more, lots more. So I, I, uh, I'm happy to see you all joining me. I'll be back tomorrow for another day text. This Sunday, I'm going, to, I'm going to be here tomorrow and Saturday, right? Today's Thursday. Oh my God, <laughs> holiday kind of messed me up. Oh, today's Friday. Yeah, flies by. Okay, so today we did our day text. Tomorrow we'll do our day text. Sunday I'm going to take off. I may do some videos though, so we'll see. And then we'll do our take. We'll resume our day text next week. We should be getting into Genesis in a week or two. A lot of material there, but we still have more Revelation. So I don't want to look too far ahead. And then next Sunday, I'm going to do open session seven. So if you have questions, things that have come up and, and you just haven't had a good opportunity to, to talk to me about them, next Sunday, not this Sunday, will be a good time for that. So I thank you all for watching today or for listening and watching. And I enjoy your comments and your participation. It always gets my day started off right. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all again tomorrow. And I hope you will have a blessed day in Jaws and in Jesus' name.